Listen only mode. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network. Uh, this webinar series is uh, help is is coordinated by uh, the EBM Tools Network as well as its sister organizations, OpenChannels.org, MPA News, and me. Um, and I'd like to also welcome today uh, my co-organizer, Nick Weiner, who's with OpenChannels.org. Um, so we are very, very, very thrilled today uh, to have Steve Cohn. Uh, with the National Whish Whistleblower Center. Steve is the executive director for the center. Uh, he's here today to talk about harnessing the power of whistleblowers, combating wildlife crime. Uh, I believe he's also going to address uh, pollution issues as well later in, in the webinar. Um, before we turn things over to Steve, I did want to let everyone know how to ask questions. So there's a question panel in your user interface. Um, to ask questions, just go ahead and type the questions into the user interface. Um, if you have just quick clarifying questions, such as you want an acronym, uh, defined, uh, we may uh, stop Steve and ask him to uh, explain that during the presentation, but most questions will go ahead and wait until the end of the presentation to cover. Uh, but you can go ahead and send the questions in at any time so you don't forget them and they don't get lost in the shuffle. So do feel free to send those questions in at any time. We do have dedicated time at the end for the questions. So Steve, I mean, we're absolutely thrilled you're here today to talk about this. It's such an interesting topic and uh, I'm going to turn it over to you so you can start telling us more about it. Well, thank you so much and thank you for this opportunity and I want to thank everyone for joining uh, the webinar and caring about these issues. Uh, whistleblowing is one of the most effective means to detect crime and that would include all crimes related to wildlife fishing, uh, marine pollution, foreign bribery that might impact wildlife trafficking, customs violations, if fish is being brought into the United States that violates various laws or rules. There's a lot covered under the basic concept. Briefly about myself, I've represented and worked with whistleblowers in my entire professional career, starting as a, a lawyer in 1984. That's all I've done. And I've been involved in almost every type of whistleblowing you can imagine from going after big banks, illegal foreign bank accounts, foreign bribery, environmental crimes, atomic energy, federal employees, etc. So in 19, two years ago, we competed for and eventually won the Wildlife Crime Tech Challenge as one of the grand prize winners with the goal of bringing the whistleblower tools and integrating them into the wildlife community. And wildlife, as under the Lacey Act and under US laws, means plants, fish, and animals. Covers anything prohibited under CITES, very broad. So I think most of you are fully aware of the scope of the problem about, we, we pulled this off of the public record, about two-thirds of ocean species are being overfished, large predatory fish have been dis, dis, decimated in their uh, populations, and the market in wildlife trafficking makes it nearly impossible or very, very difficult to detect the bad actors. And our program is designed to create sources to detect the bad actors. And that is from the day you start fishing to the importation and sales. And what we've learned over the 30 years and through numerous studies is that if you can protect and incentivize your sources, you will have a radical increase in high quality reports. 
that can be converted to successful prosecution. Just so you know, and we can come back to this, our current program, and you can see it at our website, whistleblowers with an s.org backslash wildlife, exists to connect potential sources with lawyers who can utilize very powerful U.S. laws to fight all forms of wildlife trafficking, including illegal fishing and ocean pollution. I just want to mention something now because it's counterintuitive. A corporation can be a whistleblower under most of our laws. So an NGO can file a claim and collect a reward. And an NGO can collect information from informants on the ground. Most people have a conception of a whistleblower. And as we get into our program, I'm going to debunk some of those conceptions and I think get a more realistic picture. This explain essentially I could end my presentation right here. This explains precisely what is occurring today in areas of fraud detection, corruption detection, and any type of detection of what I call hidden crimes. Crimes, if someone murders somebody, you know there's a victim. If someone robs your television set, you know you lost your TV. But a bribe, that crime is successful if no one ever knows the crime occurred. The same thing with illegal fishing. A crime of illegal fishing is successful if no one knows the fish they're selling was illegally caught. That's a successful crime. And if, you're, if I'm sitting in a fish market and I'm looking at some salmon, how would I know that that salmon was illegally fished? How would I know that? Whereas if it was my stolen TV and they were selling it out of some van in the backyard, I might know it. This is a study. This one was done by the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, the trade association of people who look at how fraud is detected. And, and they, these are the auditors, compliance officials. That's their job. But I can tell you now, I've looked at numerous studies. They all say the same thing. And if you look at this study, you'll see at the very top tip, and you'll see that the tip, which is essentially a whistleblower, is about 50% of all credible fraud complaints. You'll also look that this particular study broke up this reporting by region. So you see the United States is that dark blue, Asia Pacific, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Southern Asia. And you'll notice that the reporting behaviors are essentially identical anywhere in the world. So there's a mythology that whistleblowing somehow is more U.S. than it is African, than it is Asian, than it is European. Not true. Today, most of my important clients are international. I represent people from Africa, from Asia, from Russia, China. UK, France, Germany, Middle East, South America. And their behaviors are just like the US whistleblowers I also represent. And this study confirms that. This is a statistically valid study. So you can see tip about 50. Go down to notified by law enforcement, fourth to the bottom. You'll see in most studies it comes in around 2%. So about 2% of your successful fraud prosecutions are found by law enforcement, 50% turned in by a whistleblower. What, and these are the cases that are actually done. What does that tell you? It tells you that crime 
does pay, that without a whistleblower program or some mechanism to detect these crimes, you won't get caught, you'll make a lot of money, and we lose. Because this, if this is 2% of the prosecutions, and they're not prosecuting that many cases, I mean, how many big fraud cases are uncovered? So when the folks came up with these findings and published this, they also said as follows, to incentivize the tip to figure out ways to increase the number of whistleblowers, you will have a radical impact on your ability to detect and enforce the, detect crimes and enforce the law. And they all recommended increasing whistleblower programs. Because again, this is a static snapshot of the way things are as of a couple of years ago. This, this study actually was 2014. They all stay the same. Our goal is to incentivize the whistleblowing so this numbers of the tip just keeps going higher and higher. That's where we can have impact. This next chart is exactly what you would have thought would have happened if this chart is true. So if this statistical study is true, if you implement a program to incentivize whistleblowers, you should see a dramatic increase on the whistleblower side. So our first whistleblower law that used financial incentives was the False Claims Act. And what I mean by financial incentives is if the whistleblower's information results in a successful prosecution, the whistleblower can share in the monies collected. So the money doesn't come from the taxpayer, it comes directly from the wrongdoer the criminal, the fraudster, and the whistleblower only gets compensated if their information led to that successful prosecution. So, but for the whistleblower, there would be no monetary receipt. And under the False Claims Act, the whistleblower can collect between 15 and 30 percent of the, of the collection for which they're responsible for. So, to understand it this way, I work on a boat. I know they are importing illegal fish. I know, I have information that on the customs forms that are being filed at the point at port of entry, that they are lying, that they're representing that these fish were legal, that these fish, everything was good, when we have information that the fish were illegally caught. Well, guess what? They have lied to the U.S. government, they have lied to customs, and, there's a, and that most likely could convert to a False Claims Act case. It covers people who profit from lying to the U.S. government. So when they implemented a whistleblower law, and this is big in the area of healthcare, Medicare fraud, Medicaid fraud, defense contracting fraud, it also covers customs fraud. You can see in 1985 to 87, that's before the whistleblower law came in, that was the amount of cases that the U.S. government was able to prosecute and get fines and penalties collected. So this chart doesn't include people going to jail. It doesn't include making a company bankrupt because they were just a bunch of criminals. This is actually fines and penalties being collected. As the whistleblower law became known and more people filed, you can just 
see what happened. It went from minuscule amounts to collecting about four to five billion in fines and penalties per year. And this was the chart. This is what happened. And this is what we are trying to do in the area of wildlife illegal fishing. Incentivize, educate, promote, protect the whistleblower, get the information to the appropriate authorities in the proper manner, and let's watch it rise. This is another way of looking at it. From 1987 to 2015, so the U.S. government, 31 percent, that's what they were responsible for without the help of whistleblowers. And 69 percent of all their cases over that 30-year period all came in from the whistleblower, 33 billion. And I will tell you right now, as time goes on, that 69% will just continue to increase year by year by year. It works. U.S. Attorney General, these type of whistleblower laws, as you can see, has a profound impact. There are many quotes. All of the government bureaucrats responsible for managing these programs have, been, have praised them. So what laws are at our disposal? We have the Lacey Act, has a reward provision, Endangered Species Act, False Claims Act, as I mentioned, that would cover illegal imports. This is really big. It's a great law. I believe for illegal and unregulated fishing with the paperwork requirements that are currently in place and the paperwork requirements that are going to be added in 2018. I think the False Claims Act is just an incredible tool to enforce those laws. And Foreign Corrupt Practices Act covers foreign bribery. Again, bribery could easily be involved when people are smuggling or bringing in illegal wildlife, including fish. In 2011, our anti-bribery worldwide law, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, developed a whistleblower reward provision. So whistleblowers can get 10 to 30 percent if they turn in foreign bribery. Now again, there was mythology that, oh, whistleblowing something in the U.S., People from foreign countries will be afraid. They won't do it. It's outside of their culture. Well, this map shows that between 2012, when the bribery program got underway, to 2015, those three years, all the countries in black are where whistleblowers from that country, from Egypt, Saudi Arabia, India, Australia, South Africa, Russia, throughout Europe, Brazil, etc., where whistleblowers from those countries filed their claims under our program, or the U.S. program. So again, in looking at whistleblower laws outside of the wildlife context, they work, and they work worldwide. And we want to bring it into fishing. We want whistleblowers who get original information about illegal fishing and any harm to the marine wildlife that's covered under any U.S. law or CITES to know that there are safe avenues to confidentially and anonymously report. So already the SEC that has jurisdiction over foreign corruption has already paid non-U.S. citizens over $30 million in rewards. It's a lot of money. It's a brand new program. I'm impressed with that amount because it takes a while for these cases to move forward. And watch this. I love this one. 
This is from a law firm known as Jones Day. They are a large corporate firm that represents big business. And as I mentioned earlier, customs violations can be covered under the False Claims Act, a, a incredibly powerful whistleblower law. So when the US government started prosecuting some of these customs cases, Jones Day, the big corporate firm, issued an alert to the business community. This is word for word from this corporate firm. Importers beware. Read what they said. This is their view. This is corporate America's view of the power of these whistleblower laws. Importers are facing potential additional liability for actions taken in connection with items, importing items to the United States. Department of Justice has been bringing cases under the False Claims Act. Again, it's counterintuitive. It's not the Lacey Act. It's not some customs law, it's this law. Why? It penalizes false and fraudulent statements. So if they lie on their customs form, they're gonna be held liable, made during the import process. Look at this. The FCA is a particularly powerful enforcement tool as it allows for treble damages. So you take whatever fines and penalties you may have under Lacey or any other law, and you multiply them by three, and because the claims can be initiated by whistleblowers. This is it. This is where a, the Achilles heel of importation of any type of illegal fish or marine life into the United States. This is the Achilles heel. And this is where the whistleblower program needs to activate. I also want to mention another law that exists for whistleblowers. It's called the Act to Prevent Pollution on Ships, which also has a whistleblower provision. So it's, again, what's interesting about looking at the APPS, ocean pollution, is that it's very similar to the framework for other wildlife crimes that initiate outside the United States, but ultimately can get jurisdiction under US laws. So the act to prevent pollution on ships, as you can see, it implements the Maripol Convention and prevents ships from dumping oil or garbage in the ocean, in the high seas. So what do we know? We know that the ships are not U.S. They're mostly flagshipped from Panama, from Liberia, from Philippines. They're not owned by American companies. We know that the crew members are not U.S. citizens. Most of them are from very low paid, from third world countries. And we know that the crime doesn't occur on U.S. soil. The crime generally occurs on the high seas when they dump their oil in the middle of the Indian Ocean. But guess what? Through the creative use of the U.S. whistleblower law, the United States is the number one enforcer of Maripol and ocean pollution laws. And we just went and dug up through cases. These are the words of the US Department of Justice from official court filings discussing how they were able to prosecute these ocean pollution cases, where they got their information from, and urging the court to pay the whistleblowers rewards and here's from the DOJ. Information of this nature is otherwise difficult, if not impossible, to obtain. Well, that's the same thing you're going to have with fishing. By the time the fish is coming into the United States, where are you getting your information that it was illegally caught? 
Then they talk about how the whistleblower law is like a hand in glove to reality. Watch what they say. Again, this is all Department of Justice. The availability of the Active or End Pollution on Ships Award reflects the realities of life at sea. A monetary award both rewards the crew member for taking the risk and provides an incentive for other crew members to alert inspectors. U.S. law can't get their jobs back and they can't put FBI agents at their homes in the Philippines, but a monetary reward can do the trick. And watch. This is what we've seen. We looked at the last 75 prosecutions under this law. The U.S. government has paid international non-U.S. citizen whistleblowers $31 million. The feds have collected another $110 million uh, in, to their own treasury for fines and penalties. And restitution means under these laws, they can give up to 25% of the monies received to nonprofit organizations that are fighting ocean pollution. Excuse me, that are fighting ocean pollution. So that's what we're looking at. These types of laws need to be implemented in the area of wildlife, plants, fish, and animals. This is a discussion of when the House passed the Lacey Act whistleblower provision, and they specifically talked about the need for powerful tools. So what is a program? What would be a program for wildlife whistleblowing? One, we need to educate the whistleblowers. And we now have a website, whistleblowerswithans.org backslash wildlife, that has a tremendous amount of information about the wildlife laws. We obtained a grant, we, we were the grand prize winner of an AID-sponsored crime tech challenge, peer-reviewed and in partnership with National Geographic, Smithsonian Institute, and Traffic. Uh, they awarded us one of the grand prizes, and that enabled us to set up a nice website with information. But we can work with any NGOs, we'd like to work with as many as possible to get the word out that laws exist, that monetary rewards can be paid. Just another point, how much? The monetary rewards under ocean pollution have been averaging about $150,000 per whistleblower the largest a whistleblower got under that law is $2 million. But under False Claims Act, whistleblowers have received many large awards, and the United States, believe it or not, is paying about a billion dollars in rewards a year. I'll repeat that, a billion, one billion in rewards. Now, almost none of those are in the area of wildlife because the wildlife community doesn't know about it, isn't using them, it's all brand new. Most of them are coming in Medicare fraud, Medicaid fraud, defense contractors. We need to use this tool. It's very effective in the area of wildlife. Two, protect confidentiality, period. The best way to protect a whistleblower is to make sure nobody knows who the whistleblower is. This is true in the United States, where I've fought for years on retaliation, but mark my word, in foreign countries, where there's a lack of democratic infrastructure, where whistleblowers' lives are on the line, nothing is more important than protecting confidentiality. Now, what we have learned and what we do that's why we set up an attorney-managed program. 
because all information that comes to us is under attorney client privilege. And we've set up secure mechanisms for people to report confidentially. And as the as lawyers for the whistleblowers, our main interest is protecting the whistleblower, protecting their confidentiality, making sure there are secure mechanisms. So again, under the grand prize from the Cron Tech Challenge, they also supported us in establishing technology to have confidential reporting structures. But you have to protect your source. Three, cooperation with federal agents. Now, I must admit that Interior and Commerce, Treasury and Agriculture, they all have authority to pay rewards, but they've not set up their programs yet. And that's, we're working on that. But the U.S. Department of Justice has, and, this, and the, under the Foreign Corrupt Practices, they have. So we have safe and secure portals right now where we can bring information, and then we're working with and trying to get these departments to be more cooperative. But I want to emphasize that any import into the United States is covered under false claims, and under that law, the U.S. Department of Justice has been excellent, excellent. What's not here, and the slide, it might come, but I want to just discuss it, which is an NGO can qualify as a whistleblower under Lacey Act, under Endangered Species Act, critically under the False Claims Act. And under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, an NGO can qualify as an analyst. In our view, especially in the world of international whistleblowers, this sets up a, a, a way, a, a mechanism for an NGO that's, say, active in Thailand or the Philippines or Indonesia to act as an intermediary. We work with them. They work with the local sources. The whistleblowers can be compensated, but the NGO can be a buffer and can also help vet sources and work with law enforcement to make the cases as credible as possible. So don't think a whistleblower is just this Edward Snowden type. No. They can be an organization. They can be a high-ranking corporate official that wants to expose the wrongdoing. They can be a fisherman. We have discovered that there have been many, many, many lost opportunities to work with whistleblowers. So, for example, many of you know the tragedy behind the Vaquita porpoise, which most likely has gone extinct just recently in the Gulf of California. It's a tragedy. As we've learned about the destruction of those numbers, and as this porpoise declined, we went and started looking into the record. Lo and behold, the, this comes out of the reports out of Mexico from this commission. Fishermen who wish to comply with regulations. That is the whistleblower. I don't care if it's the contractor, the banker. This is the worker on the ground, and there are honest people who want to do the right thing. So they found them right here. This was years before this porpoise <coughs> most likely has gone extinct, who wish to comply with regulations, feel they are being undercut when illegal fishermen operate without constraints or punishment. They are blowing the whistle on the lack of law enforcement, most likely the corruption that was going on with local law enforcement that was permitting these illegal fishermen to operate. Now, on the act to prevent pollution on ships, what made that law so incredibly effective today is that the crew members simply used their cell phones to take pictures and document the 
oil being, being dumped. These fishermen could have gotten monetary rewards at much larger amounts than the illegal fishermen were being paid to kill endangered species. It's a lost opportunity. So what you have so one of the reasons we're bringing this out is you have to think in terms of sources and think in terms of how to incentivize and protect them and bring these potential sources to the forefront. That's all about me. Here's our contact information. Rewards for whistleblowers. And I want to say just one last thing, which is we have a book called The Whistleblower's Handbook. It's coming out now this month. It's entitled The New Whistleblower's Handbook. And it has extensive information on illegal ocean pollution, wildlife trafficking, foreign corruption, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. All of that has been added to the handbook. So it has a transnational focus, also a domestic USA focus, and it now incorporates information on all of the laws which can be used to successfully fight illegal, unregulated fishing and destruction of marine wildlife, ocean pollution. So with that, my prepared remarks have come to an end. These are all of our the places you can find our information, and I'm open for questions. Okay, Steve, thank you. This is fascinating, and I'm so glad you're doing this work. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone how to ask questions. You type them into the question panel of the user interface, and I will go ahead and re relay them to Steve. Um, so we have a few already. One question that came up is, does the Lacey Act extend to illicitly obtained aquacultured shellfish or finfish? Shell, oh, shellfish and finfish, yeah. If it's covered under CITES, the answer is yes. The Lacey Act incorporates the, 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 the rules of CITES into our domestic law. So if something is, is impermissible under CITES, say it was listed from Nigeria or listed from Thailand, it's incorporated into our domestic law. So I don't know whether those particular species are categories are covered, but if it is, it's covered. Also, there's the new U.S. law that's coming into full effect in 2018, strengthening all of our laws on unregulated, illegal fishing. So it incorporates that. And under another law called the Fish and Wildlife Improvement Act, every law, every fish protection law covered and administered by NOAA and the National Marine Fisheries is covered. It's everyone. It, it's the Arctic fishing, salmon, dolphin. It is like 40 separate fish protection laws that are in the United States administered by National Marine Fisheries or Fish and Wildlife. They all have a whistleblower law. Okay, great. Thank you, Steve. Um, a question also came in, are the monetary rewards tax-free? No. The monetary rewards are not tax-free. However, the IRS told us that if the whistleblower does not enter the United States, and they never have to, the U.S. Will, will not tax their reward, and then they can be taxed under their own country or whatever they want to do with it. Uh, it's a very good question, under, uh, but, but you have to pay the piper, unfortunately. They are taxed. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Another question, there's a titanium mining occurring by a Chinese company in Colonet, Baja, California, Mexico. There's talk of building a huge sh shipping port there to export titanium and fisheries products. How do we keep this transparent and legal? That's an excellent question. And the way you have to do it, is he, and the way we analyze all of our cases, is to break it into little pieces and figure out whether we can attach a whistleblower law to it. So first, are whatever they're doing there going to be imported into the United States? As I say, if there's importation to the United States, bingo, we have a very strong customs law that can incorporate wildlife. Second, foreign corrupt practices, bribes being paid to foreign government officials. Now, the law says it has to be a U.S. person who pays the bribe. So most people think that foreign corrupt practices is somehow very restrictive to the U.S. It's a good assumption. But it, looking at this map, which includes China, you then have to ask, what is a U.S. person? If some of the Chinese officials there also own homes or have property in the United States, do they have bank accounts in the United States? Many do. In terms of a U.S. person, U.S. companies are obviously covered if they're doing some of the work or contracting. But guess what? A company publicly traded on a foreign stock exchange can be considered a U.S. company if its stocks are permitted to be sold to Americans. So let's assume, and again, this is just, these are the type of questions we would ask if a case came in. Say there's a Mexican, large Mexican construction company building a facility. Does that Mexican company trade on, say, the Mexico City Stock Exchange? Is it a publicly traded company? Doesn't matter if it has no U.S. employees. It doesn't matter if all the bribes are paid in Mexico. It doesn't matter if it's a Mexican person paying the bribe and a Mexican person receiving the bribe. If that company permits Americans to buy their stocks, and it's through a mechanism that some of you may be aware of called an ADR, American Depository Receipts, it's a technical securities term, they're an American company. We can go after them. We can sanction them, and some of these FCPA penalties are in the hundreds of millions of dollars. The Chinese company, the same way. Are they publicly traded? So when you start really analyzing these types of cases, especially if they're a large money case with big companies coming in, you will often find a direct U.S. connection that, again, you may, the, the companies aren't even, even aware of it. They think they can get away with it because they're somehow, we're outside of U.S. law. That's why there's a lot of very successful Foreign Corrupt Practices Act cases filed against companies outside the United States. So the way to do the case is if you have the whistleblower and you have the information, is it just has to be carefully vetted and reviewed confidentially with an eye towards protecting the source. Okay, thank you, Steve. I think you've made the person who asked that question quite happy. Um, okay, another question that came in. Some domestic seafood products that travel interstate require a, a accompanying paperwork. If these seafood products are sold or purchased without the paperwork, is this a violation of the False Claims Act? Well, probably yes. Probably. We just have to look at the specific requirements and what those what the specific law and regulations say. 
So again, we have to vet it. But paperwork, believe it or not, are the best type of False Claims Act cases. Because if you think of the word false claim, you are making a claim generally in paper to obtain some type of benefit. The benefit could be the right to import, the right to move it interstate, the right to sell it. You're getting a benefit from a piece of paper handed to the United States. And guess what? Because the False Claims Act is so successful, over 26 states, including California, New York, have adopted False Claims Act under state law. So if the state has rules and regulations governing the import, the selling of fish, you may come under those state law rules, which also means it kind of opens it up. It might be a way that if the laws aren't good right now, if there are loopholes, it can be fixed not just on the federal level, but also at the state level. But that is the beginning. So I would say if someone had a case like that, I would love to look at it immediately. I would love to look at any type of case where you have evidence that the paperwork is not accurate. That is a potentially a very good case. Okay, thank you, Steve. Now you said foreign nationals as uh, person individuals are eligible to receive reward claims, as are nonprofits. Now, is, does that mean foreign um, NGOs can receive claims? Absolutely. Okay. So. Because the whistleblower laws have been so effective, let's, just, we have, let's go back to this. When our government began to realize that the whistleblower incentive laws are exceptional, they're really, really good at detecting crimes, they loosened the definition of what a whistleblower is. And the, the, what people think, it's really just not what it is. It's, it's, you wouldn't, we, uh, I've represented many corporate officials, president of a company, vice presidents, people who would, you never imagine it are whistleblowers, most anonymous and confidential. But because they want the information, they loosened the definition. And key to this was what they did in the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. So what they did in that law, and this is where kind of dovetails to an NGO. They said a whistleblower can be your traditional original source, your stereotypical whistleblower, but it can also be an analyst. And an analyst is someone who has no original information, but can gather information from other sources and effectively present it to law enforcement for a successful prosecution. So they shifted from a traditional whistleblower law to let's get good information. And as we have studied it, that analyst concept for foreign nationals and for foreign NGOs seems to be a fantastic fit because, you know, someone, a Filipino fisherman might have difficulty contacting a lawyer in Washington, D.C., but it might be easier for them to talk with a local NGO in Manila. So that's how it works. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Now, what um, means is the whistleblower center using to get word out about um, your new app and how uh, and just about whistleblowing in general and how people can report crimes to uh, ships crews and other people who are involved with um, marine wildlife crimes. Well, that's the new frontier. So phase one was having a website that people could go to. And it's translated into French, Spanish, and English. We'll want to translate it into other languages, especially uh, the Filipino languages and, and, and the languages of people where, 
who, who work on these crews. Uh, but right now we have three languages and it's up. We have a small budget now we're going to be using for Google Ads and other ways to get it out. But that's why we're doing this webinar. That's why I went over to Thailand and our chief operating officer went over to Africa. We are trying to talk to as many people as possible and we really would like to partner with NGOs where the NGOs can put the information on their websites, can refer people here. We can work with the NGOs in terms of uh, full cooperation uh, in, in how we process information. But we do think that the NGO community is the next phase, is the next group. Uh, we are really a, simply a support organization. Uh, we would provide support to NGOs and whistleblowers that want to go forward with either educating people or filing claims. So we're not directly in the space of, say, protecting fish. We are a support organization to everyone in that space. And that's our next move. Okay, great. And I'll send you a couple ideas that I have about people who might be uh, have good contacts with NGOs. Um, and, and that is essential because that's really the way we can get the word out, is by talking to the people who've been in the field, have experience, have networks, and just try to get it out through them. Okay. And uh, sort of a related question that came in, um, do you have partner organizations in each country that whistleblowing has happened so far, the countries in black on the map? Right now, uh, one organization, the African, uh, the, the Elephant Action League, has joined with us. They have our stuff on their website for Africa. They, they, do a, they have a site known as Wild Leaks, and now they're informing their people through that process about the rewards and about how to communicate with us. Uh, a number of NGOs have actually signed on as clients, and we're just working with them. You know, they have sources on the ground, and that's all confidential, attorney-client privilege, and we're just working with them to build cases and provide them assistance in understanding how the laws work and how to work with uh, their people. So we're relatively new. Our online is maybe about three months old and we're open, so we would love to partner up with groups in every continent and groups that have, uh, you know, specifically in the fishing area and marine protection because in my analysis, a lot of this fish comes into the United States and as I like to say, it's an Achilles heel. The issue about the transport companies, I want to really make a big pitch out there. I am disgusted with the oversight of the transport companies. In my little investigation, they are pathetic. Uh, we had one whistleblower come in from a major transport company, and it only took us about 15 minutes to realize that that company, publicly traded, was covering up issues. Their quality assurance program was a cover-up. They had systemic problems, and they clearly would have lots of whistleblowers. Transport companies are another Achilles heel, and we really would like to work with whistleblowers who have information on those companies. Their boats enter U.S. ports, and they should be held accountable to the fullest extent of the law. Okay. Um, okay, if anybody has tips on that, uh, could you put your information back up, Steve? Be good to... Sure. And again, if you want to partner, if you want to work with us, if you want to discuss a potential case, these are our uh, uh, various email addresses, websites. So the one here, MG, for Mira, who's a, a lawyer working with our program, who's now managing our attorney referral service, mg at whistleblowerswithans.org. So just to understand what happens, if you were to communicate there, or you could just come online at 
Uh, you can send it to wildlife at whistleblowers or just come on and file a form. We have a form you can fill out at whistleblowers.org backslash wildlife. But really, you could just send an email to Mira. She's a lawyer. She's running our referral program. And anything that comes in, we will look at. Most likely, we'll cross my desk. We will analyze it. We'll try to see what type of case there is. We'll either do it in-house or we'll try to find a cooperating lawyer to take it on if it looks like there's a case. Any communication to Mira can be considered attorney-client privilege. But while I'm here, I want to emphasize a couple things. Never use your company's email. Never use a company or a government laptop cell phone. If you use their technology, they can find you out. If you send it from work, they can find you out. Just go to a, 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 an email address that you own that's not associated with the work or create a new one just to become a whistleblower <coughs> and send us the information. NGOs really don't have to worry about that as much as an individual. But I've had some hor I, one gigantic horrendous case which the whistleblowers were using uh, company property and the company was able to capture all that information. It was terrible. Okay. Well, that's a, a great warning and we'll end on <laughs> that note. Um, Oh, but, oh, actually, I do have one other question. Is there any place in the world you sort of want to start your efforts that you suspect there is a lot of potential uh, for stopping wildlife crime? The, as we're looking at it now, it's at the ports, where the ports where bribes are paid and the ports where the fish would be shipped from. Often there's paper keeping requirements there that are bribed up that are falsified. And obviously the ports in the United States where it comes in to the United States, same issues. Uh, so we're looking at ports because we like, because ports can get us bribery, ports can get us false claims, and ports can get us lacy actor endangered species. It's a good way to look. But let me also say, just high quality whistleblower can be from anywhere. And we'd love to look at that case. We'd love to see if they have a good claim. Uh, one last piece of information, the largest whistleblower reward in history, where a whistleblower was given a monetary reward. I did the case, I was the lawyer. So you can hold on to your seats. You can all guess how much money was this whistleblower handed in a check from the United States of America. Think it through. I'll give you the answer. One hundred and four million dollars. One whistleblower handed that check. Now that's extraordinary. It's the largest ever. But for a whistleblower to be given a significant check is not uncommon. It all ties back to the quality of information and whether or not we can marry the information with a law. But it has to start with the whistleblower, the source. And the source has to know that there are ways to go confidential, that there are ways to be compensated for the risk, and that it's it, that again it can be worthwhile to at least see if you have a case. These cases can originate anywhere in the world. Okay. Well, I'm going to start hanging out port at ports with my camera, Steve. Um, well, thank you so much. This was fascinating, and I'm so glad you're doing this work. And um, I'll certainly be in touch after if, if as I have a couple of ideas. And I hope all of you who are uh, on the webinar, if you have ideas, you'll also reach out to the National Whist Whistleblowing Center uh, with any ideas you have. Um, this, this is a, a great cause. OK, thank you so much, Steve. Well, thank you so much. Take care. OK, bye. And have a good afternoon, everyone.